All right, welcome everyone to our next episode of DC Thursday. I'm Pete, um, it's great to have you with us. We've had uh, a lot of great guests over the past couple months as we've uh, launched these events this summer. And uh, I'm very excited to have our guest today who's been a friend for many years from the data community. Um, Wes McKinney and I actually met during some really odd circumstances in New York City. Um, there was a multi-day power outage in, Wes, was it 2012, maybe? 2012, yeah. 2012, there was a multi-day power outage in New York City. I didn't have any power in my apartment and a data friend from the community connected me with Wes and I literally slept on Wes's couch um, in Williamsburg. And that's when we first started to talk about the work you were doing on pandas and other things. So that's just a funny little, um, anecdote, but um, Wes has been a good friend and obviously a known figure in the data science community. And so I'm really excited to have you, Wes. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on the, on the, uh, the show or, or podcast or video cast. Yeah, the stream. <laughs> yeah, awesome. It's a, it's a live stream with a live community question. So we'll get to those uh, in a minute. But I just wanted to call out um, some of the great work that you've done, Wes. I think most folks are probably familiar with you from Pandas, as I mentioned. Um, you've also wrote a book, Python for Data Analysis, uh, published by O'Reilly. And then more recently, um, you started a company called Ursa Labs, which I know is the entity supporting your work on Apache Arrow, um, which we'll talk about um, a bunch today. So um, obviously those are some great credentials and um, lots of folks in the community know you. Um, I also wanted to mention just as sort of a background, um, in case folks aren't as familiar with Arrow, which a bunch of our conversation today will be about, um, Arrow has been around since 2006. Um, you've had eight, uh, sorry, 2016, uh, four years. You've had 18 major releases um, of the language or the, the library, um, 500 unique contributors, 50 million in package installs in 2019, uh, 52 committers and 29 PMC members and 11 programming languages represented. So Arrow has become um, a bit of a thing in the background. Uh, I know it doesn't necessarily have the same representation um, in the way users use it as Pandas does, so it might not get the same visibility, but um, we're gonna talk a lot about Arrow today and um, I'm excited to hear you um, sound off on sort of what's new with the library um, how Arrow is used and what it can be great for. So um, Wes, just to kick things off, I know you had a major release in the last uh, couple of months, the Arrow 1.0.0 release. Um, considering that the package has been around for so many years, um, what's the significance of this release? And talk us a little bit through that. Sure. Um, well, the, the 1.0 release is the first um, the first release that we've declared to be formally stable from a from a binary um, uh, from a binary uh, protocol level uh, point of view. So we um, we've been working the last four and a half years uh, to develop the um, Arrow columnar data format to build libraries in multiple languages that implement the format um, and developing you know kind of working out all of the the fine details of how uh, you know how the format works, how we transport it between uh, between languages and systems, how we serialize it, how we write it to files on disk, uh, how we can move it over move it over TCP, like send large data sets in a streaming fashion. Um, and we also wanted to, you know, given that the arrow is very much a chicken and egg problem, where um, you know people need to take spend some time with it before they're able to give substantive feedback about what it does and what it what it does well and what it doesn't do well. So we wanted to take like a good um, period of time, like a pretty long period of time to allow people to show up and provide feedback about the project because as we start um, committing to things being stable, it becomes more and more difficult to change things. And so we decided that, you know, initially we thought we might have been able to to make a like the arrow format has been uh, for all practical purposes stable since the end of 2017. So for almost three years, um, that was the last time we made like a, a disruptive, uh, you know, non-backward compatible 
compatible change, but we, we didn't want to declare it stable and close the door to making, you know, potentially breaking changes in case some people came out of the woodwork and found some problem with the format that they, we need to change something that would be a significant benefit uh, to the project. So we also, um, a big part of the, the 1.0 release was that we completed um, a significant amount of compatibility testing between some of the major implementations. So between the C++ library and the Java library, we have really comprehensive um, protocol level integration tests that compare um, data payloads, like essentially batches of arrow data that are produced by Java, produced by C++, and making sure that, that you know, both languages agree that the data is down to the bit level identical. Uh, we do have integration tests as well in, jo in uh, JavaScript, Go, and Rust, um, but they're, uh, comparatively speaking, less, less uh, feature complete than the C++ and Java implementations because those have been um, the projects that have attracted the most developers uh, in, the, in, in the open source project so far. So I understand for sure um, how this, this notion and this um, commitment to forward and backward compatibility is important, especially because um, Arrow is um, sort of used as a data interop interoperation layer between systems. Um, and I, I've seen recently that um, Snowflake has adopted um, Arrow internally um, for some, some use. Um, BigQuery has adopted Arrow. Um, so you must be really excited to see uh, these kinds of larger projects um, start to come on board. And um, I understand that this uh, forward backward compatibility issue is something that's, that's super important um, to remember um, with, along with this 1.0 release. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, like if you're if you are a database vendor, um, then then having forward and backward compatibility is is really important. From from you know, if you deploy a piece of if you deploy a service or a server with one version of the project, like you might not be able to roll out upgrades to that service um, for a period of years. And so, the so the you know for everyone who's not aware. So backward compatibility means that newer versions of the library can understand data produced by older versions, whereas forward compatibility means that older library versions can detect um, that features are being used that they don't understand from the future. So if we add something to the format that we have the ability to communicate that we're using uh, some new unknown feature to the past, or if we're not, you know, or if we're not using any new features, then we can be assured that we're producing data that can be consumed by a library that's you know two or three years old. So if you roll out like a database um, and it doesn't get upgraded for two years and it allows you to um, you know import and export data in arrow format, you aren't going to have any system crashes or like it isn't going to be interpreted as being some you know be interpreted incorrectly by the database. So you've called arrow a collaboration between database systems and data science ecosystems. Um, can you elaborate on that? What exactly does that mean? Yeah, well, uh, so, so for me, the, the reason I got involved in the project was because I was, uh, I, I started working at Cloudera at the end of 2000, uh, 2014, they, they acquired my startup Datapad. Uh, so we all joined, uh, we all joined Cloudera and my job there was to explore deeper integrations between uh, Python and pandas and the big data ecosystem. And one of the things I found was that um, there was no standard uh, way to exchange large batches of, of uh, tabular data between uh, different data processing engines like database systems such as Impala or general purpose distributed computing systems like Spark. There was no standard uh, protocol for, so let's say, moving you know, 100 megabytes or a gigabyte of data at high speed. Uh, so that struck me as like uh, something that was missing from uh, from the ecosystem. Another another problem was that uh, the absence of um, a standard data representation meant that there also uh, were not are not available standard libraries for performing um, database operations. So if you look at the internals of pandas, like pandas implements all of its own algorithms for doing database operations, like. Uh, grouped aggregations, joins, filtering, sorting, 
um, like all of that, all of that stuff that is very similar to things that you would find inside a SQL database in pandas, we had to implement entirely ourselves. And so, so part of the, so one purpose of Arrow is to have a standard, like a common data layer that's language independent that enables systems to move around large amounts of data at the highest speed possible. So we get rid of um, data conversions and serialization overhead between systems, but also by, by providing a standard and stable uh, data representation, we can develop uh, common reusable libraries of analytics and algorithms that perform database operations. So we can create you know, standard implementations of joins or aggregations or sorts. Um, and those can be used in the data, in the data science world where our algor the algorithms that we use are actually relatively primitive in their implementation. Or you could take the same algorithms and build an analytic database if you want to. So by creating like this environment where database engineers, database developers can collaborate with data science, people who build data science tools, uh, for me is really exciting. And it just purely at a computational level, um, the, you know, the, the, tool, the algorithms and the, the computational systems that we use in Python and R are really far behind the things that you find on the cutting edge of the analytic database world. So things, even what was the state of the art 10 years ago in 2010, you know, thinking about like uh, databases like VectorWise, um, which, uh, you know, the, one of the VectorWise creators is, is a founder of Snowflake, for example. Um, and uh, so, you know, you have all, you've had all this, these advances in analytical computing for analytic databases in the last 20 years, but very little of that um, like intellectual, like heritage from the analytic database world has made its way into the hands of the everyday tools that are used for data science. So basically we just aren't getting as much out of our computers, like out of our hardware um, as we, you know, as we could. And you you converted pandas um, to the arrow format as well. Is that right? No, um, uh, pandas has has its own uh, internal data representation, which is um, which is built using uh, using NumPy arrays, but it's not exactly NumPy. And part of this is a historic artifact uh, from uh, from the origins of pandas. So back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, when I was starting to build pandas, um, having uh, having good interoperability with NumPy was essential for getting people to use the project because Pandas was a brand new project. And I think now like there's plenty of people who use Pandas that don't really know how to use NumPy uh, very much at all. So the, um, so it's a, a different relationship now versus uh, 12, 13 years ago. Um, but that said, the Pandas community is in the process of retrofitting, incrementally retrofitting Pandas with um, with optional arrow functionalities, for example, using arrow to deal with strings, because hmm. um, we can represent a column of string values in pandas uh, vastly more efficiently with the arrow format, and we can process, um, you know, we can process the, that string data uh, when it's in arrow format in more than an order of magnitude faster because the arrow format is designed to be very efficient on non-numeric data as well as numeric data, which is not true of non-numeric data in, in, in pandas. So it's certainly a process because pandas is a 12, a 12 year old project um, to make any significant changes to the internals. So the pandas community, I mean, I'm not involved in pandas development day to day anymore and haven't been for, for about seven years, but um, I know that it's, it's, it's like a tension. It's like how, like, how, how fast can pandas make changes to its internals, which may affect its users in certain esoteric ways while also, you know, innovating and improving on performance and memory use. So it's this balancing act of like not wanting to disrupt or harm you know, people who are running pandas in production while also making progress on the, on the performance front. Got it. So you mentioned that um, Arrow came out of some of the work that you were doing at Cloudera when you realize the need for these systems to um, share a common or the benefit that would occur if systems could share, share a common data format. Um, what are some of these use cases and who needs Arrow most now? Right, so the, so the, the, original, so the original motivation um, was, to, to, was to create um, a richer 
uh, language, language extension API for, uh, for Impala, which is now Apache Impala, which it's a uh, distributed analytic, uh, analytic query engine. And so databases typically have uh, what's called a user-defined function API. Um, so you can write user-defined scalar functions, functions that process one row of data at a time, and you can write analytic functions which accumulate and reduce uh, a table to single values. But if you want to do some of the more complex um, pandas type operations that you would express with the, the group by apply paradigm, um, that doesn't really fit naturally into the um, into the into the data frame into the to the databases uh, um, execution model. So we, we wanted to do a couple of things. So we wanted to provide a way to write um, user defined functions uh, with the existing APIs in Python and make them efficient. So you would send a batch of data to Python and then you could run pandas code on it. Um, and so we were trying to make that as efficient as possible. Um, but we also wanted it to develop like a more, like a, like a better language extension API for databases. And incidentally, this is the exact same problem that Spark and PySpark has. So one of the things that we did early on, um, so I, I moved from, from Cloudera to Two Sigma and Two Sigma you know, was and is a big user of Apache Spark. And so my, I worked with uh, my colleagues there, my former colleagues at Two Sigma, along with some folks from IBM to build Aero support um, into Spark. Uh, for the purposes of accelerating custom running custom Python code inside Spark. So now you can write um, use the pandas UDF interface in Spark to um, to extend Spark SQL and Spark data frames with custom pandas based code. And we were able to get, you know, in some cases like a 50x speed up by by using arrow for the data interchange. That said, Spark is not arrow native and neither is pandas. So there's still quite a bit of serialization going on. But simply by using Arrow, um, because it's so efficient for shuttling data around and you can convert to and from pandas so efficiently, we still are able to get you know, a 50x speed up in some cases um, by changing from an inefficient way of moving data to Python to a more efficient, more efficient one. And the same is true, I think, in general for database drivers and database protocols that um, that they were, aren't really designed with the needs of Py, like languages like Python and R in mind. So it's very expensive to convert from their um, client server protocols to a pandas data frame or to an R data frame. Whereas you can convert from arrow to R or arrow to pandas very, 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 very fast. Got it. Um, so I wanna just take a second to um, remind the audience and the listeners that um, we'll be able to take some questions for Wes. So if you want to type in your questions into the chat, um, we'll get to as many of them as we can during our conversation. Um, so so Wes, let, let's let's dive a little bit deeper then um, into Arrow. Um, how does Arrow work and how does Arrow sort of facilitate this, this magic um, across these systems? Well, um... So the the arrow uh, so the arrow project is is uh, is has a few different layers. So the first thing that we built in the project uh, was we designed a language independent memory representation of data frames effectively. So uh, it's it's pretty nuts and bolts. You can read the specification online, but it describes the exact bit level and byte level uh, layout of each uh, type of data. So if you have a column of strings in a table or a column of numbers, or you could have a column of nested types. You could have a column of structs or lists, uh, which are called arrays in some in some systems. Um, so we defined the exact memory layout for those things, and then we developed a a protocol, like a, what we describe as a um, uh, interprocess communication protocol for arranging um, an arrow um, batch, which are called record batches into a byte stream. So there is a metadata prefix, which is serial, which contains the descriptions, basically the, the memory locations of each column in the, in the stream. So whenever you receive a batch of, of arrow data through shared memory, uh, so if you memory map a file that contains arrow data or you use operating system shared memory, or if you receive a batch of data over TCP, there's a really there's a small prefix right at the start of the stream that describes the entire batch, 
So you can resolve all of the memory locations of the columns in the data set um, by looking at that metadata. And so basically what the arrow libraries do is they construct data structures that reference those memory locations. So you don't have to move any of the data around or do any copying or conversion when you receive, um, when you receive a batch of data. And because all of the technology that we use to build the format is not coupled to any programming language, um, we, you know, we can build native libraries in, uh, in, in, you know, in, in any language. The only requirement that, uh, that they have is, is that they have, that they use or can interface with uh, an implementation of flat buffers, which is a Google project um, that is similar to protocol buffers, um, but is a bit lighter weight. And we use uh, flat buffers only to serialize metadata. So none of the data itself ever touches flat buffers. Uh, so we, we have our own protocol for arranging the, you know, if we have a gigabyte of data, like that's all handled outside of flat buffers so that the flat buffers is only used for the, the message prefix, which enables a library to understand where to find each column in a, in a data set. So this notion of zero copy seems to be an important um, guiding principle of Arrow. What, what are some of the other design principles that you followed when architecting this protocol? Um, well, some of the other principles in designing the, the format itself, um, we spent a lot of time thinking about um, processing efficiency because it's not, it's not enough to simply be able to transport um, the data very quickly. We, we also want it to be um, a favorable in-memory format for processing. So if, if, for example, you load a big data set into memory or maybe you memory map a large data set on disk, and in order to get good performance out of your analytics, out of your algorithms, if the first thing that you do is convert arrow to something else and then run your algorithms on something else, then that, that doesn't really make sense. So we want to, we want to be, we want to use arrow for data interchange and arrow as the in-memory representation that we code all of our algorithms against. So we were very careful in, we were very careful in, in thinking about um, how to make sure that um, you can iterate through a data set uh, without having cache misses on the CPU, um, that the, let the memory layout of strings is efficient to process, for example, um, and that you can do efficient uh, transformations of schemas, like you can select columns out of a table or you could uh, unnest a nested structure and select fields out of a struct or out of a, some other nested structure without doing any, any data copying. Um, we also wanted Arrow to run well on non, you know, non uh, CPUs, so on GPUs, for example. And so we've seen people um, doing using Arrow both on GPUs and FPGAs. And so, uh, notably, the NVIDIA Rapids project, uh, QDF, uses Arrow as its data representation uh, for representing data on the GPU. And you know, they recently published a set of benchmarks where they completely destroyed the, uh, you know, the state of the art in, in big data benchmarks, um, all using QDF and Dask for distributed orchestration. And they were able to get uh, 20, 20 times performance improvement um, at uh, one third the amount of power usage. So if you think about like the amount of data, pri um, you know, the amount of data processed per kilowatt hour, that's a 60x um, uh, I guess it's 3x improvement in power utilization and 20x improvement in performance. So it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. And so um, Arrow is optimized for columnar type operations. Is that a, a good way to think about it? Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's oriented around columnar vectorized query processing. Um, so it's a, uh, yeah, so if you if you have an algorithm that that needs to go uh, row by row and visit all of the columns in a in a data set, that's the worst that's the worst case scenario for Arrow, scenario for Arrow. Um, but that's that's a well known kind of trade off between row based systems and columnar based systems. Um, and in the database literature, there's been um, there, there's been uh, some study of the trade offs between columnar uh, systems versus uh, versus row-based systems, and in recent years, with um, 
as LLVM has become a mature technology for, for a runtime code generation, it's become a lot more practical to build high performance row based database systems because based on the structure of the query that you write, you generate, um, you generate custom code that is specific to that data schema to perform various operations. Whereas uh, in, in vectorized systems in, that are columnar, um, they don't need to take, they don't necessarily need to use um, things like runtime code generation because you're making a decision about which algorithm to call um, kind of at the, at the vector level, kind of at the column level. So you're, you, you say, okay, I'm gonna call this pre-compiled function on this column and it processes the whole, the whole column chunk in a, single, in a single go rather than having to, you know, having to inline logic with a, with a custom compiler. So um, on that note, I know sometimes folks get maybe um, slightly confused between when to use Arrow and when to use Parquet. Um, even though they're obviously different technologies, they support um, certain types of com columnar notions. Um, can you explain the relationship um, if there's any between the two? Yeah, so uh, importantly, um, some of the same, some of the same uh, designers of Parquet are uh, helped to design, help design Arrow as well. So Julian Ledem is the main, you know, one of the ar main architects of Parquet. Uh, and he and I worked closely in the early days of, in the early days of Arrow. So Arrow and Parquet were always intended to be companion technologies. Um, you can use Arrow to store data. So par Parquet is, is exclusively for data storage. Um, it is not a runtime data format. So when you read a Parquet file, you have to decode it and then put the data somewhere. And so the arrow format is intended to be that somewhere that you put the data when it's read out of a Parquet file. And if you look at other databases, like if you look at database systems that use Parquet, it, typically they end up with their like a custom Parquet implementation that's optimized for loading Parquet files into the database's native um, native in-memory representation. Um, that said, there are more and more people that are using Arrow for storage. Uh, so if you are working on, if you have a, if you're working locally on a machine that has a solid state drive, you can write an Arrow data set to disk and then memory map it and then process it as though it were in memory because the on-disk representation is the same as the in-memory representation. Uh, we did recently add um, simple compression for storing uh, for storing arrow and sending data um, over the uh, over the wire. Like so, if you were sending data um, over TCP, which I, I think we'll talk a bit more later uh, in the stream, um, you might want to compress it using LZ4 or ZSTD, which are two uh, new state of the art compression codecs, and you get. Uh, by spending a little more CPU time compressing the data, you can get better end-to-end -end performance because, um, you know, if you're on a gigabit a gigabit network, you can only move data at, you know, 128 megabytes per second. So compressing it will give you better. You know, you can the the bottleneck is your network. So if you make the data smaller, your whole application goes faster. So we have a bunch of questions coming in, Wes. Um, let's take a couple. Matthew is asking, is it possible and advisable to use Arrow directly in a, nat in a native data intensive application instead of using Arrow indirectly by a DB like application? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the things that, so what we've, a lot of what we've been doing the last four and a half years in the open source project is creating a development platform for you to build custom data processing applications that use Arrow. So like we do intend for you to choose one of those libraries that is um, the language that you prefer to use. So if you're using C++ or you're using Java, you can install the, the Arrow libraries and use um, their, it's like in C++, we have built like a pretty comprehensive development platform that contains like an IO subsystem, like a file system subsystem. You can use the libraries to interact with Amazon S3, for example, um, we have like, pretty sophisticated tools for memory allocation and dealing with um, like, you know, like, mem like memory, like managing memory lifetime. So if you allocate some memory and then split it up into pieces, um, 
the system can, you know, can reason that there's still like a lingering reference to a piece of memory and prevent it from be being deallocated. So, so we built the libraries um, intending for people to use them directly to build custom data applications and not, not just for people to build databases and then for other people to just use those databases. But you can use, you can use the libraries to build a database if you want. Another question, um, Alessandro is asking, PyArrow currently has a reader for ORC files, but not a writer. Is there any plan to add a writer anytime soon? Uh, people, have, uh, people have asked for it. Um, I know that, uh, I guess my, you know, my, my Ursa Labs team, uh, it, isn't a pri it isn't a priority for my team in, in the short term, but it's, uh, um, it would be a good, um, so part of, so, so part, of, part of the issue is that there, in the past, there was not a C++ based ORC, ORC writer. And so we implemented, or we received a contribution from Anaconda actually of an ORC reader. And since then the, the writer in C++ has matured and we're waiting for a volunteer to um, emerge to implement the writer uh, it, you know, implement the arrow writer interface. Um, so it's, you know, it's probably a solid, uh, you know, few weeks of work at least for, for a motivated developer. But as soon as we have uh, a writer in C++ for the format, we could expose it pretty easily in, in, Py, in Python through PyArrow. Got it. Uh, Matthew is also asking, is the memory model of arrow NUMA aware? Um, it's, it's, it's not something that we, it, so, so for people that don't, so people that don't know, so NUMA has to do with, with servers that have multiple, uh, multiple CPU sockets. Um, it's not an issue that we deal with, uh, directly in the library. So it's something that it's something that your application, um, that your application will have to reason about. So for example, like we provide a, in the C++ libraries, we provide a device API, which enables us to reason about like what, like where a piece of memory is located. So we can distinguish between memory being on one of the GPUs in the system versus being in CPU memory. Um, but having not done development on a, on a multi, multi socket system, a multi-socket system myself. Um, I'm not aware of the particular nuances of what what we could reasonably provide in the in the libraries that would help that would help with that. It would probably be something that your application would have to deal with on its own. Um, one more, Wes. Chuck is asking anything worth mentioning regarding the representation of any values in Arrow. Any design challenges or trade-offs? I see a null type has no physical storage in the API. Um, any values? Is that, I guess I'm I'm maybe having oh, a hard time parsing. Oh, and 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 a values. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, uh, well, all 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 data types in in Arrow are uh, nullable and have and use the same. Um, data representation for representing null. So there's an accompanying um, bitmap where when a bit is set, so there's one bit per value. Um, so we, we pack, we, we have a packed bitmap. And so when a bit is set, that means that the value is not null. And when the bit is not set, it means it's null. Um, and one of the benefits of using the, using the bitmap representation is that we can, um, we can use um, hardware operations to count set bits in a run of values and then determine whether or not we need to do null checking when we're performing an algorithm. So when you don't need to check each value, whether it's null, which is the case actually with pandas and with R, for example, you get way better performance because the CPU doesn't have to do branching at the, at the cell level in the array. Um, so we're pretty happy with that choice and it's consistent with, um, with the way that, um, um, a lot of database systems work. Got it. Well, um, I want to make sure we have some time to chat about flight um, because flight is 
uh, something that um, is is really interesting in terms of bringing some distributed systems like uh, capabilities or power um, to the Aero framework. Um, so do you want to explain to us what flight is, Wes, and, and why that's a big deal? Yeah, so uh, so flight is a um, flight is a project that, um, that that you know my team and I have have been collaborating on closely with with Dremio and uh, and Two Sigma to build a uh, general purpose framework for implementing Aero native data services. Um, it's built one layer above above gRPC, which is Google's um, RPC and and messaging library. And, uh, and so what we did uh, was we provide a uh, command layer for implementing a, a service. So if you, you, if you were a server that wants to receive commands and then return arrow data sets as the, as the result of those commands, Flight is a, is a library which enables you to implement such a service. And what we've done is we've dealt with the low level integration with gRPC. So it's such that you as a developer only have to think about arrow data and we handle the, the details of transporting it efficiently over gRPC. So we did some low level stuff to, with gRPC to avoid um, memory copies and serialization. Um, and we've been able to, to achieve uh, really impressive end to end uh, performance and scalability uh, through gRPC. So a single thread um, in flight can, can deliver data end to end at, at well over uh, you know, well over two two gigabytes, sometimes over three gigabytes per second, um, over uh, over TCP. That's of course on local hosts, so there's no impact of network uh, of network transfer speeds. But when you consider that that's you know end to end moving data from one process to another, that you can only really achieve that level of performance when you aren't having to serialize. There's no data conversions at all, so we send. We send a byte stream, and that byte stream is inter reinterpreted as an arrow data set um, on the other side. So we're really excited, uh, in particular, about using Flight as a replacement for um, the database type protocols that people have been using for the last 20 or 30 years. So things like ODPC and JDBC, um, which are pretty standard, but they're um, they're inefficient to the API that they provide. Um, is pretty inefficient for loading data into um, loading data into things like pandas data frames or R data frames, whereas you can load data from Arrow very efficiently. So, um, so we're we're anxious to see database vendors and and data systems in general implement Flight um, because it you know makes delivering data to data scientists significantly faster. And you have only one. If you have a flight client, you can interact with a flight service, and you only have one, um, you know, way of accessing data to to uh, uh, to, to think about. Um, that said, there are, are other uh, companies that have been using Arrow with, but not Flight, as a way to accelerate their database clients. So, uh, for example, Snowflake and BigQuery have both used Arrow, but not necessarily Flight, to implement. Uh, um, to implement their, uh, to accelerate their, their clients. Uh, but that's partly because their clients are not based on gRPC. So we, uh, but you know, gRPC is a good choice if you're uh, building a standalone service that needs to process a high volume of requests and be really reliable because it's literally the transport framework that powers a lot of Google. And so um, in order for someone to use gRPC, uh, what's, what's happening under the covers, that's that's implement. It's an implementation of protobufs in some way. Is that is that right? No. So so uh, um, so gRPC uh, allows you to um, allows you to write to implement gRPC services using um, using the the protocol buffers language. So you can write down. So they they have some extensions for protocol buffers, and then a plugin for the pro protobuf compiler that. Um, will generate the gRPC service stubs. Um, but gRPC itself as a framework doesn't, um, doesn't understand protocol buffers. It's, it's uh, agnostic to the, the uh, data serialization format. Um, it's easiest to use, uh, to use gRPC when you use it with protocol buffers because that's also you know, Google's 
uh, preferred data serialization format that they use internally. Um, but uh, so we, de we define flight as a, um, a gRPC protocol buffers based definition. And we use protobuf for the representation of all of the commands that are sent um, in flight. But then we implemented some custom um, serializers, quote unquote, that step in in between the protocol, the gRPC and the protobuf library um, to prevent any unnecessary data copies from being um, from being made. But if you if you were to interact with if you were to be aware of a, of a flight service and all you have at your disposal is gRPC, you and the service definition for flight, you could still interact with the flight service without having even an arrow library. So that was important to us that we didn't want. Um, like we wanted people to still be able to uh, use the service and issue it commands without necessarily having a full arrow library at their disposal. And how has the adoption of flight been so far? What, what are you most excited about um, flight enabling teams and, and engineers to do in the future? Well, flight is really, is really about, um, is a couple of things. So it's, it's about um, enabling uh, data applications and data scientists to get uh, access to data um, faster and more efficiently because they're using this much more efficient um, protocol for accessing, accessing services. It's also simpler because if you have, if you go from um, a world of, of having to use multiple different client libraries to ac access different data services. So if somebody puts a flight front end in front of a data service, then you don't have to think about like, oh, which client do I use to interact with this vendor service? And so you can use the same client, the same flight client library to access many different data services. From the standpoint of the data engineers or the, the data platform folks, flight also makes their lives better because they you know, can standardize on a, on a common way of implementing, providing a service front end for, for data access. Um, and by using flight, because it means more efficient, uh, more efficient transport of data that the services, so the person maintaining the service will get better resource utilization, um, will be able to hire, uh, handle a higher volume of requests and handle more data requests using the same amount of hardware. So that also lowers um, the cost of operating the data infrastructure, which of course the person who paying the AWS or the JCP or Azure bill will be very happy about. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, and so where can people find more info about Flight Bus? Well, that we have, we, we published a blog post um, last fall. Um, um, like we've, you know, people have been aware of the project. We've been working on it for, for about two years now, but um, we launched it to, to beta effectively last fall. So there's a blog on arrow.apache.org. Uh, that introduces flight. Um, I've given a number of talks recently where I've gone deeper into um, uh, deeper into flight. So I spoke at uh, Dremio's um, um, subsurface mm -hmm. uh, virtual conference, and my talk there was about was about flight. So you can look up there's a, my video for that is on YouTube and my slide deck. So you can check you can check that out. Um, and Dremio because Dremio is an Arrow Arrow native um, query engine and data lake engine, um, and they are uh, they are working on delivering Flight natively as a as a way of interacting with um, with Dremio. So I'm excited to see that go to production and for Dremio users to be able to um, to use Dremio to build their applications rather than having to go through JDBC or ODBC, which is a lot slower. Great. Well, um, I want to shift gears a little bit and um, take the conversation in a slightly different direction because, um, Wes, you and I have had chats over the years about just the open source ecosystem in general. And um, being that you've been so involved as an um, instigator, an author, a committer, a leader of um, several projects now that have been very meaningful for many, many folks um, and have sort of touch the lives of data science and analytics professionals um, everywhere. I know that you've spent a lot of time thinking about the sustainability of open source, the economics of open source, um, how to measure the, the success of an open source project, um, how to get the community riled up, and sort of all of these softer things around what it takes to really 
launch and manage and be effective at open source that um, you've given a lot of um, a lot of thoughts to over the years. So I'm just curious, like maybe as a way to back into that, um, for you right now, how do you measure the success of a project like Arrow, for instance? Like what things are you sort of watching for in terms of KPIs or um, how are you as a as an author and a, a, a promoter of this project, how are you measuring success um, right now? How do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of there's a number of dimensions to look at. So, I mean, one you know one obvious one is is to the extent that you can measure project downloads. Um, that's I think that's that's a helpful that's a helpful metric to see whether the, the software is being used. So the fact that um, you know, we've seen exponential growth in um, the in number of installs of the Arrow packages has been uh, has been great. Um, so, like Arrow is being installed about a third as many times as Pandas. So that's you know pretty significant adoption considering Pandas is you know one of the most most installed Python packages, scientific Python packages after um, after NumPy, which everything depends on. Um, I think something that people don't appreciate as much is community growth. So if you had a really popular project that only has a handful of contributors, that becomes a big, a big liability because it means that the number of stakeholders, like developer stakeholders in the project isn't very high relative to the project's importance. And so in, in Arrow, one, something that we've, I think my team and I have spent a disproportionate amount of time is growing and supporting the developer ecosystem around the project. Um, so part of that is making the project um, easier, easier to contribute to and to provide more systems that support um, developer productivity. So like automation in CI and packaging, um, like testing, like, cause there's not everything, we can't test everything on every commit um, but there's a lot of things that we do want to be able, people to be able to test on demand. So like we've built um, like an on-demand, um, like, like a, a job executor for, for testing various odd corners of the project. And that's helped, that's all integrated in GitHub and has helped people a lot. Um, I guess another metric is look, just looking at industry adoption of the project. So, um, you know, we've, like I've spent a lot of time on outreach to different companies that are that we see that are using Arrow or considering using Arrow and working with them to help make sure that they're uh, successful using the project. Because if we build the software and then, you know, people using it at scale are having a difficult time, then there's some, you know, we need to change our priorities. Um, so I think when I've, you know, very deliberately in, in setting up um, Ursa Labs and defining our relationship with um, the companies that sponsor our work, um, you know, kind of wanted to create this symbiotic relationship between a group of open source maintainers and um, companies like we've been working with hardware companies like Intel and NVIDIA, who also are users and contributors uh, to the project, as well as a number of financial institutions. So Two Sigma, which has been funding the project for over four years now, um, some other institutions that are using Arrow, like uh, like Bloomberg, for example, uh, is using the project for various things. Um, so they've been sponsoring sponsoring us and some other uh, some other financial firms as well. Um, so that's been, a, I think, a good working model in that, like, we want to create, like, uh, so you know, we so like we act as as facilitators for um, for getting work done in the project and making sure that the you know corporate stakeholders so people that are using the project in production that their needs are being looked after in the project or if they have people engineers that are contributing that we're helping them you know get prompt code reviews and get their work into the project um but it's yeah it's definitely a thorny problem i will say that you know given how important arrow has become in terms of um improving performance and efficiency in people's data infrastructure i think that's Definitely made our lives easier in terms of sponsorship and uh, sponsorship for for the work. Um, you know, compared with, you know, I think sometimes open source developers like aren't nearly so like um, aren't nearly aren't that close maybe to like a cost center in an organization. So because when people adopt Arrow, their computing costs go down and their applications get faster, 
And so there's, it's a lot easier for a company to measure the ROI of um, making, you know, making Arrow better. Whereas other open source projects like the connection between cost or, or productivity may not mm. be nearly so clear. And so in those cases, that's where it's really difficult for, you know, if you go to say, ask a, an organization for $10,000 or $50,000 to sponsor development, it may be hard for them to really judge whether or not there's good ROI for them to, to sponsor, um, sponsor at that level. So it's difficult. And I think we, you know, we also have to, to make sure that we're doing a good job of communicating the value add of the project and explain kind of how like our vision for what we're doing is, is related to like the goals that, 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 um, you know, that the in industry has in, in their data infrastructure. Well, I have to say, um, you know, personally speaking, I, I understand um, from the perspective of another founder investing in building data community, um, you know, data council is not sort of writing bits and designing software like you are, um, but we're still in the business of creating community around the data ecosystem, um, transferring knowledge um, and sort of getting engineers and data scientists set up in order to be able to meet each other, share with each other, discover each other, interact with each other, et cetera. And so we have sort of this unique um, notion of being a standalone third party community that's not tied on to any one vendor. And, yeah. you know, the, the, the way that we've been able to monetize that is through events and conferences. And that was really yeah. Yeah. The, the most viable business model that we could come up with. But it's a little bit odd to be a standalone community oriented organization um, that basically has to rely on corporate sponsors, sponsorships. Maybe, maybe it's not odd. It's just sort of the, the, the only way I figured out how to do it. But I feel like you've sort of mirrored that in terms of like embracing this quote sponsorship model with open source. Um, do you think that that will work for other projects? I mean, I guess you already mentioned sort of some of the challenges with um, whether or not there's a close tie to the, the value prop. Um, have you seen any other open source projects um, start to sort of approach it from this, this angle? Yeah, I mean, I recognize that I recognize that we're um, I recognize that we're in a in a in a somewhat unique, uh, unique situation. So like the thing that I think the thing that really has made has made Ursa Labs work, for example, is our relationship with, with our studio, which has been providing um, the majority of our funding and all of the administrative mm. support for the team. And so their motivation um, is not only to improve interoperability and synergies between Python and R, so a lot of data organizations use both languages together, um, but our, you know, our studio became, um, at the beginning of the year, a public benefit corporation and part of their public benefit is investing back in in the growth and sustainability of, of data science tools, and so their sponsorship of Aero development is about um, doing good in the world through through better through better tools. And so I recognize that the same sort the same kind of path is not going to be available to uh, to a lot of open source projects because there's not a lot of companies like our studio around. Unfortunately, I hope to see more companies um, with a mission that's aligned with you know, public good and building open source software. Um, but I think it's more typical that you see, um, you know, companies selling either building an enterprise support business or doing more consulting or making money through, I think, organizing. Um, I know in the early days of, in the early days of, of, of Databricks, uh, you know, I think, um, I think the, the uh, Spark, uh, Spark summits and Spark conferences um, were a, a you know good source of revenue for you know companies like Databricks in the early days, and I think that's been true of some of the other open source um, you know companies. That it's good for building the community and um, and sort of exchanging ideas, but um, but you as kind of a community facilitator and creating like this environment for cross cross pollination, like that has a lot of value. And so if that enables you to um, also, you know, to uh, sort of continue to do more community development, or in some with some companies that are, you know, able to fund uh, developers to um, to build the open source projects that they're that they're organizing conferences for. I mean, that's that's fantastic. So, but it's definitely very challenging because there isn't really an efficient way to to extract sponsorship from 
from organizations. Like to me, the, the, you know, the ultimate solution to funding open source development would be through, uh, would be through taxation. So basically taxing corporate profits, because you think about like what, like what is all of this open source innovation uh, yielded for the economy, like the world economy. And so businesses are able to achieve such massive scale and such massive impact through all of this, all of this technology, which has been made, built and made available for free on the internet. And so if a company, you know, it's hard to measure exactly, well, how much of a company's profit has been boosted by, you know, their use of open source, but you know, if, if, if we under, if we undercut it, if we, uh, if, if we uh, misestimate by maybe a factor of 100 and we tax just a little bit of corporate profits and we use that to fund, um, you know, to fund open source developers, I think that seems okay to me. You know, maybe we can buy a few, like a, we can buy fewer uh, fighter jets or something like that. And we can have, um, you know, happier uh, open source developers that are able to but it's like it's it's sort of it's a bit short-sighted that the that you know that the U.S. government uh, and other and other world governments um, haven't really incorporated like the support of open source infrastructure into their uh, into their budgeting because really like free freely available like and you know sustained innovation and in open source makes businesses more successful and so which is going to increase corporate profits and then fund and then fund the government so. A little, I think, a little bit of of uh, investment from uh, from from the governments would go a long way in in terms of making the making the ecosystem more sustainable. So I will keep hoping that that will occur in uh, in my lifetime at least. Um, but you know, with the way that things are going, uh, you know, not just in the United States, it, it, I could be waiting a long time. <laughs> Well, maybe there's there's uh, other newer licensing options as well um, that become more prominent or recognized as, as sort of being the need um, to support the open source world. I know there's some innovation and a bunch of people thinking about that as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Wes. Well, um, thank you for, for joining us. Um, just in terms of a, a final question, um, since our time is up, I just wanted to ask you, What's the most surprising thing you've learned um, in the last few years, uh, especially building Arrow? The most surprising thing. Um, <laughs> that's a it's a it's a loaded it's a loaded uh, it's a loaded question it's a loaded question. Um, I will say like around, I think, I think one of the things I, that I didn't understand as well um, a few years ago was that I kind of around the open source economics question um, was that probably the biggest barrier to corporations funding open source is the way that they budget. And so because there is not a clear, like a clean line item mm. in people's budgets for sponsoring open source, that makes it difficult for, um, for you know whoever is uh, you know responsible for or interested in sponsoring a project, they don't have like an obvious place like you know to 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 put it. Whereas mm -hmm. like you know people have huge budgets to pay for computers or to pay for cloud computing or to pay for enterprise software, but there's no like you know people are not yet in a point where they are alloc you know they're um, you know they're reserving you know even one tenth of 1% of their IT budget to fund, to sponsor open source. Uh, and so it, it wasn't as apparent to me that that was a problem until I started going out to, uh, to look for sponsorships. Um, and then people would say, oh, well, you know, we don't know where the money's going to come from. And then you say, well, you're a very rich company, you know, clearly, you know, you find enough money between the seat cushions, but it's, it's turns out it's not that simple. Hmm. Well, that's well said. And for those of us who are starting companies or or, um, or who have management um, uh, budget budgetary availability in terms of our IT operations, I think that's definitely worthwhile considering and um, appreciate all of your work with the community over the years. I know it's been hard for you sometimes to figure out um, how, to, how to make a living doing this. And so I salute you for 
all those years that I've known you since um, 2012 and all the work that you've done, um, the companies that you've joined, the, the drums that you've, that you've beat um, just to sort of make this issue aware for all of us. And so I hope that um, this is a continued wake up call to folks that um, we need more economic support for open source. And it probably does lie mostly with the companies who have the, the means, um, if not the, the budget uh, allocated, at least they have the means to sort of fix that problem and, um, and start to figure out ways to support meaningful open source projects that they use every day. Well, thanks, thanks for joining us, Wes. Um, this has been fun. It's, uh, great to see you and um, looking forward to uh, more updates on Arrow and, and flight along the way. Yeah, thanks, thanks Pete, for, uh, for having me. All right.